Our First Testament lesson comes to us from the book of Numbers in the Pentateuch. There in the 21st chapter, beginning at the fourth verse. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way of the, to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable manna. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord for us to take away the serpents. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent, set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole, and where, whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Turning then to the New Testament, we read this week at the Gospel according to John. There in the third chapter, beginning at the first verse. There was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader among the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born anew from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born again of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I say to you, you must be born from above anew. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes to. So that it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to Jesus, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. Yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how then can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one who has ascended into heaven, except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so also must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world, God gave God's only begotten Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned. Those who do not believe have already condemned themselves because they did not believe in the name of the only Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. All who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. Those who do what is true Come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. So end our lessons for this day. When our children were between five and nine years of age, their greatest delight was catching snakes. We lived in upstate Wisconsin where there are no poisonous snakes and they would gather garter snakes and rat snakes and they had one special favorite called a hog snake. And the hog snake 
had a rattle on its tail and diamonds on its back like a rattler, and it stood up straight and had a wide neck like a cobra. But as they also grew to be about 38 inches long. But as you got close to it, if you reached out to touch it, it would fall over and play dead. They would put these in their pockets and come to dinner. And in the middle of the meal, they would pull them out to put on the table or give to company who had arrived. The purpose of today's sermon is not to tell you to go out and find snakes. The purpose of today's sermon is to ask, what are you afraid of? Is it snakes? Is it pain? Is it death? Is it the death of your child? Is it that the, your children will come back when you least expect them? <laughs> Is it the death of your spouse or the illness? Is it your job? Is it the economy? What are you most afraid of? In the wilderness for 40 years, the people became impatient and the people became bored. What a terrible indictment. God loved the world and formed every different element of it. For the last century, we've been arguing over whether there is evolution or whether there is creation. That is not the purpose of the Bible. The point of the creation story is to describe that God loved the world, loves us so much that God not only created the world, but also created the means for its redemption, gave to us God's own child, that we would believe our greatest effort, our greatest gift was supposed to be that we would love, that we would believe, that we would hope, that we would have faith. And instead of having meaning in life, instead of having hopes and dreams and love, we were bored. We are a people who have expectations. Every week when Doris concludes the prelude, we know that the water is going to be poured and we're going to pour out all of our past so as to be present in the moment to receive God. We know every time Mario steps up, he's going to say, good morning, church. We know when we lift the bread that it is the body of Christ. We know when we pour the cup that it is the blood of Christ. We know and are prepared for all these things. The difficulty is that the Greeks came before the Christians. And with the Greeks, we learned a dualism to the world, that there is night and day, there is dark and light, there is evil and good, there is body and spirit. So it is when Abram and Sarai received a new name from God. They believed that they would have this child, but they didn't yet have it, and they didn't yet have the promised land. They were only now pregnant and wandering through the land that would, in future generations, be theirs. When the slaves in Egypt received the law from God, they believed that they would come into the promised land. But coming across the Red Sea, they wound up in the desert instead of a land of milk and honey. We have been about winter for the last six months. It seems to be the season that will not end, and we can't get through it to the next. Faith is about living in the cross, living in the moment between the past and the future, knowing what is to come, but not yet having it all together. The problem whenever things don't happen the way in which we want them, when we have our fears and our doubts and our concerns, is as people of faith, we form committees. And the very first committee we always form is the Back to Egypt Committee. They did in Numbers chapter 14. And they did again here in the 21st chapter. When the people were filled with fears and the people were impatient, they elected captains, they gathered in groups so as to complain. 
you know the complaints. We've never done it that way before. We have a policy against that. We don't have a policy to deal with that. We did it that way before and it didn't work out. There's no money for this. There is money, but it's been earmarked for other things. No one's going to want to do that. Future generations will not respect it. And so it goes over and over and over. In 8,000 years, humanity has not changed. We are just as impatient as the people of Israel were. In the 14th chapter of Numbers, the people complained bitterly. And God described to Moses that God was going to send infliction and hardship and disease upon them. And Moses begged for the people. And God relinquished. But here now, seven chapters later, the people again are complaining and forming committees against God. And this time, God goes ahead and sends the serpents. And the serpents bite people on the legs, and they die. But the people change their hearts. The people realize their sins. They came and confessed them to Moses, begging him to petition God for them. And he did. And God did, saying, make a serpent and put it on a pole so that all would look to it. And that symbol of death, that symbol of their fears, that which they were most afraid of, would no longer be their fears alone. But they would see through it that this came from God as a means of testing us, as a means of challenging us to a deeper level of belief, a deeper level of commitment to not be impatient, to not be bored, but instead to believe. Every time I look at the serpent upon a pole, I think about that Greek symbol for medicine, caduceus, where there are two serpents intertwined around the pole. But that's not what this is about, because the Greeks came thousands of years after the Hebrews. In South Sudan, they've been dealing with a medical crisis for as long as anyone can remember. 80% of the guinea worm is located in South Sudan. Ten years ago, it was 5,600 cases. This is a tiny parasite, microscopic in size, that exists in stagnant ponds. And when it's ingested into the human body, it seeks its way into your arteries. And there it grows like a tapeworm until it clogs up the artery and blocks it off until you become crippled in that arm or leg or it goes to your heart and you die. Through the work of UNICEF and the World Health Organization and our own John Dow Foundation, we've gone from 5,600 cases in South Sudan to 70 in the last 10 years. It's all but been eliminated. It's been reduced by 90% because of the dedicated work of people of faith who've tried, who've struggled, who've said, it's not just going to be death, but we can see through this to the possibility of purifying the waters so that water wouldn't be a means of death, but would be a source of life. That water might be a place for baptism. That water could be a place of stability for the people. When Jesus was in Jerusalem, he met at night with a leader among the Jews named Nicodemus, who came to him totally confused by what Jesus was saying. I don't get it. It's not rational. It's not logical. You want us to believe in life after death? You want us to believe in forgiving other people? These are the people who've hurt us. These are the people we've been at war with. How can we ever forgive? When we're afraid, how do we believe? And Jesus described, in the wilderness with Moses, they lifted up a serpent. In the same way, the Son of Man will be lifted up before you. God sent God's Son into the world to give everlasting life to a people who were perishing, that they would not be condemned, but would have everlasting life. 
We've taken this and it's become so familiar to us at football games and sporting events. Today at the hockey match, there will be signs that say John 3.16, as if everyone is supposed to know what that means. To the Aramaic listeners that Jesus spoke to in his day, this would have been polar opposites. To say those who are condemned, those who are perishing, to have everlasting life. Those are extremes. To be perishing, to be condemned, is not simply to die. To perish, to be condemned, is to be out without that which God gave to creation in giving life. To be without God. To live a life as a rock. To live a life as dirt. To live a life without hope. To simply be dead and unmoving. But if we are moving, if we are alive, if we can have hope, then to believe, to see the Son of Man lifted up so that that cross would not only be a symbol of death. In the church, we've done a strange thing. After 2,000 years, we've made this into a bronze icon. We've made this into an idol that we look to. In the same way, King Hezekiah, a thousand years after Moses, saw the serpent upon a pole and decided to break it because it was a symbol of death. And the people only saw in it their idol, like a golden calf on a stick. Instead of a symbol of death, instead of a symbol of suffering, which is what the Romans had imposed on the Jews and on the Christians, that they would look on this and be afraid. Instead, because of the resurrection, we saw through death to the possibilities that are there, to a life beyond life, to an everlasting hope with God that we would never, ever be alone, that we wouldn't have to live in the past, but we could forgive and we could believe anew. My wife and I got married a year out of college. We've been married for 34 years. I wish I could say that every day has been glorious. It's been the fulfillment of all my hopes and dreams, and I've been everything that she wanted. It hasn't been. There have been hardships. There have been difficulties. Those challenges have been opportunities. Those times of boredom. Those times when neither of us really knew what we wanted to do and we sat in the car saying, so where do you want to go? I don't know, where do you want to go? And we got in a fight over nobody really wants to go anywhere. <laughs> Became times for us to say, what do you really want to do here? How tragic that our faith, our marriages, our children, our careers, our hopes and dreams would become boredom. These are symbols of everything we believe in. What does your marriage mean to you? What does your partner, your spouse, the one that you gave your life to, what do they mean to you? What is your health to you? Too often we don't consider our health until it's too late and we're ill, and then we wish for it back. What is your child? This little child that for a month of contractions has been kicking us, what does that child mean to you? We've had so many wars. What does our nation mean to us? We have fought for the freedom to cast our ballots, to elect our leaders. What is our nation? our community, mean to us. For the last 10 years, we've had two baskets hanging above the doors. We sponsored four refugees from South Sudan in 2001. In 2003, John Dow came dancing up to church one Sunday morning. I've never seen anyone smile so big. And he said, Pastor, you remember that passage in the Bible that says the dead have come back to life? 20 years ago, I knew my family were killed. 
and they knew that I was lost, and I just spoke to my mother on the telephone. She's alive and well, and so is my father. She's in a refugee camp in Uganda. And there in Uganda, she made these two baskets for us. And when she came to the airport, she was carrying them as what she had made for us. Not only that our lives would be bound up together, which was the macrame of this, but that one would be full of rice and one would be full of beans so that all who would pass through these doors would be filled, would never grow hungry. All of these are symbols for us. But there's a difference between a symbol and a sign and seal of a covenant. A symbol is like the snake. A symbol is like the flowers. A symbol is like the logo on the Presbyterian flag or the American flag. These are symbols for us. But a sign and seal, this is what a covenant is all about. This is the water in baptism that is the Holy Spirit. So that we're not only baptized in water, but also baptized into that spirit. That we would not simply be human beings, but we would be gifts of the spirit here in this life for each other. The bread and wine would not only be the body and blood of Christ, but would be the sign and the seal of the covenant between God and us through his life and his blood. It's so easy for us to be afraid of snakes, of disease, of death, of job loss. It's so hard for us to trust and to forgive and to believe. But we are called to be the people of faith. And so we are.